Goomba Malgan, Goomba Nani Genandu, Yurigiri State Library of Queensland Goo, which is good evening. It's good to see you and welcome friends to the State Library of Queensland. My name is Vicky McDonald and it's my great privilege to be the State Librarian and CEO here at the State Library of Queensland. And on behalf of my colleagues, I welcome you to the second Game Changers event for 2021, Conversation with Dr. Sean Parsons of Alum. Let me begin by acknowledging Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and their continuing connection to land and as custodians for sto of stories for millennia. We are inspired by this tradition in our work to share and preserve Queensland's memory for future generations. I'd also like to extend a warm welcome to our special guests for this evening, Dr. Sean Parsons, CEO and Managing Director of Alum, Professor Amanda Goodmanson, Executive Dean QUT Faculty of Business and Law, our facilitator, Ray Weeks, CEO in residence at the QUT Business School, members of the Library Board of Queensland, the Queensland Library Foundation Council, and Queensland Business Leaders Hall of Fame Governing Committee. I also extend a really warm welcome to our founding partner, QUT Business School, and our generous sponsors, Picture Partners, Channel 7, Morgans, NAB, and RACQ. And also welcome to friends and supporters of State Library. It's terrific to have you here in the room tonight. Game Changers is a Queensland Business Leaders Hall of Fame initiative, a partnership between QUT Business School, State Library of Queensland and the Queensland Library Foundation. It brings together innovative leaders from business, technology and creative industries who encourage us to, and challenge our thinking to be bold in new ways. The Queensland Library Foundation is a founding partner of the Hall of Fame and works to support our projects and services. Please consider donating to help us to preserve the state's unique history and culture for future generations. So to the theme of this evening, the outbreak of COVID-19 and the unprecedented global restrictions that followed have dramatically changed the business landscape, perhaps forever. We have seen large and small businesses rethink their approach to staying afloat. But like all challenging times in human history, COVID has prompted new ideas and out of the ordinary approaches. It has fed innovation and inspired new thinking, which is what we also love here at the State Library. The accelerated medical response to the detection and prevention of the virus has become part of the new landscape. So it is with great appreciation that we welcome our game changer for tonight, Dr. Sean Parsons. A clinically trained business leader, he has led the development and rollout of breakthrough medical technologies. Sean began his career as a critical care, critical care clinician with postgraduate training in emergency and intensive care medicine, working in major metropolitan hospitals in Queensland. He created the company Alum in 2010, after noticing a lack of fast, effective diagnostic tests during the swine flu epidemic. Sean and Alum, a digital diagnostics company, have created a COVID-19 home test for over-the-counter use, which the US government has secured in a $302 Australian million dollar deal. I hope you were inspired by tonight's timely event. Tonight's conversation is being broadcast on Facebook Live and on our website's live stream page. We will be using Slido to collect questions from both online and audiences here in the auditorium. So go to slido.com and enter the event code QBLHOF or simply scan the QR, card that, QR code that appears on the screen throughout the event. And Ray will do his best to answer as many questions as possible. If you have connection issues on the website, try heading over to our Facebook page to view the, the uh, talk there. If you are sharing your thoughts about tonight's conversation on social media, we encourage you to use the hashtag QBLHOF. But before I leave you this evening, I'd like to encourage you to see our latest exhibition entwined, People and Plants. It's here on level two in the SLQ gallery just as you leave this evening and it explores our relationship with the botanical world through immersive projects, fascinating pro photography, historic illustrations, and stories that provide insights to the state's unique plant life. You'll have the opportunity to, treasure, to view treasures from our collections, and, and many of these works have not been on display for over a decade. 
or you may like to visit our Deadly Threads showcase in Kiraldargan. Sports jerseys, as well as protests and commemorative shirts, tell the story of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander pride, artistry and defiance in this unique showcase on Level 1 in Kiraldargan. But for now, it's my great pleasure to introduce tonight's facilitator. Ray Weeks is currently an adjunct professor and the CEO in resident at QUT's Business School. He's also chairman of the CEO Institute of Queensland. Please join me in welcoming Ray Weeks and Dr. Sean Parsons to the stage. Thank you. Evening, Sean. Evening, Ray. Evening, all. Let's start off now, just to repeat maybe a couple of things that Vicky said. It's clinician working in remote Queensland communities, understanding the poor access there to health services, uh, dealing with the swine flu epidemic, wanting to make a real dent in the transmission of flu in the community, coming up with the idea for a loom from these experiences. Founder and CEO of a loom, international medical entrepreneur. Take us through your personal journey and how you got to the point, this point today, and wh what have been some of the key influences on you during that time? Well, uh, look, thanks, Ray. The, it sort of, I never would have thought that I would ever get described in those terms, and, and it still seems a little bit odd, so um, it's quite a compliment. And um, before we get going, uh, thank you to the, to the State Library, Vicky, and the terrific team here in the um, State Library. What a wonderful place, and um, such mm. a thrill to be here. Um, so, for me, this was more accident than, than a plan, mm. and it really arose from a desire to solve a problem that I saw through that swine flu pandemic time. So, I, trained as, I grew up in Brisbane, born in Brisbane, um, at the Mata, just up the street, mm. and uh, grew up here and went to school here and, and went to Bachelor of Science and then medical school here in, uh, here in Brisbane. Uh, did my formative years at the Royal Brisbane Hospital, and then did a little bit of play and a little bit of a little bit of travelling the state and working in remote and regional Queensland, including some some really um, terrific time in uh, Indigenous communities, Aboriginal mm -hmm. communities in mm -hmm. the far north, and um, and then came back to to my training here in in critical care, emergency and ICU here in Brisbane, mm -hmm. and uh, and that was really when I was uh, the swine flu came along in late 2009 and and continued through into 2010. And, um, and the, the impetus for this all really came from my experience in that swine flu pandemic. Mm. And uh, the, probably the key point, if I were to think about that through the lens of a couple of different patients, the, the most important one was, uh, was actually a, an 18-year-old apprentice electrician who um, had been waiting in the, in the waiting room at the, uh, at the Kabulcha Hospital, which mm. was where I was working at the time. Mm for about four hours. And um, as a favour to my colleagues, I picked up his chart before I went home as a means of trying to clear the waiting room a little bit. And in talking to him and hearing his story, you know, he was really wondering, do, do I have swine flu? And, and if I do, can you, what, what can I do about it? What should I do about it? And so this kid had been, kid, this 18 year old chap had been, um, uh, anxious enough to come and wait in the waiting room and to seek care from a clinician mm. for that period of time and goodness knows how many people he had spread it to through that process and I felt when I saw him that I couldn't really answer the question like I didn't know if he had swine flu maybe maybe not mm. you know yes you look sick you, your symptoms are consistent but that's not a very precise answer and so I rang up the lab who to see if they had any rapid tests and there was a couple of relatively poor quality tests that were floating around and I, I had heard about these and so I, um, I took a swab from this fellow and I walked, this is about 11 o'clock at night, and so I walked it around to the lab mm. and, you know, kind of the, you know, the nighttime laboratorians aren't that accustomed to people kind of knocking on the door and <laughs> bringing, walking the sample around <laughs> and saying, you know, not only, you know, do I want a, the test result, I actually want to see you do the test. Like, let's, how does this, how does this work? And, um, and we did the test and we went through the process. It took about half an hour and he was positive for flu, he, for flu A. Mm. And it was with that bit of information that I could go forward confidently and say, yeah, you, you've got flu and it is almost certainly swine flu. Mm. 
And here's a script for Tammy Flew, which was 50 bucks. And that's a relevant thing if you're an apprentice electrician. And he asked if he should go and see his pregnant sister, to which I could give a good clear answer because flu is a really high risk thing for pregnant women. And um, he asked if I could write a medical certificate because, you know, you're an apprentice electrician. You don't go to work. If you're not at work the next day, you, mm. you need to have a medical certificate. And so we did all those things and he left with what he needed. And I realised that that was good. Mm. good. But in the process, how many people did he spread it to? Mm. How did it just... It, and, and I felt like it just didn't make sense. It just... It didn't make sense. If he could have made that diagnosis himself, if there was a test that was simple enough for him to do mm. himself at home without me, we could have done all of those things remotely. Mm, like you probably didn't have to go through that process of spreading all of that. And so that was really the, the impetus to say he, he would have bought a flu test, mm. I'm pretty sure. And that was the beginning of why not? Why can't we do a home flu test? Let's get to a loom. We're talking about you, you attracted this initial seed funding of $250,000, yeah. which gave the investor, you're very happy today, it's one hell of an investment, 10% of the company at that point. Yeah, I thought he was crazy at the time. And, uh, <laughs> and like, well, it was an idea. And it had a, like 10% a of the company for $250,000. It's a $2.5 million valuation on an idea. And I'm like, that's, that's nuts. Like, it, <laughs> I'll do my best, but no promises. And um, yeah, he's done okay. He's done very well. <laughs> He's done okay. well. We'll come back to your board and uh, the directors and so on, how important they've been to you. But describe what Vicky mentioned too, is the, uh, the $300 million plus funding mm. from the US government coming out of the Department of Defense, the uh, health, the US health uh, group. Mm. So why? How, to, to take us through how that funding came about. You had the US Federal Drug Administration, of course. Take us through the how you dealt with those institutions. Yeah, um, so uh, long, long story, I suppose. Um, well, the short answer is we earned their trust mm. and, and really earned it over the best part of 10 years. Yeah. So one of the first employees at Illum was our head of regulatory affairs, a woman named uh, Miriam Batistuta, who there's not a week that goes by where I don't count my mm. lucky stars that I met Miriam. And with her guidance, we went and met the FDA for the first time in 2013 to understand how we could do this. What, what, was, what was the pathway and how could we navigate that to get a home flu test through with the agency um, willing to bless it at the other end? Others had tried beforehand and had been knocked back. And so it was a matter of us listening to what the FDA had to say and then folding those lessons into what our product would need to be and then going back with a repeat proposal on what we thought would be appropriate and listening to the response. And that, that happened five, six times between 2013 and 2018. Mm. So we had um, significant interactions with the FDA over that period. What that meant was when COVID came about mm. and, um, and we took our existing tech for flu and we made it work for COVID, mm. which was a non-trivial change, there was a fair bit in doing mm. that, they, they understood the technology. They knew, all, they knew us, they knew what we were doing, they knew our tech, they knew its advantages. But they, they had confidence in the data? They had confidence. Mm. And so that was very important from the FDA's perspective. Mm. The FDA really lives independently, well, for the most part, of the rest of the US government. So, um, you, know, the, the, you know, the NIH has, has little if any sway on mm. the FDA and the Department of Defense has little if any sway. Mm. Congress has some sway, mm. but not, um, and even then, not really all that much. Th but um, the FDA, we had, earned, we had earned their trust over quite a long mm. period. The other thing that happened was that in um, about June of last year, we received some, a little bit of funding from a new National Institutes of Health program called mm. um, RADx, which is the Rapid Acceleration of Diagnostics. It's a, it was a little bit like the moonshot, the um, sorry, the warp speed program for yeah. vaccines, except to nowhere near the same magnitude. And um, we received a million dollars for some proof of concept work, which went well. They gave us a $30 million grant in about September to prove the tech out and to build a facility in Australia to get to scale quickly. Um, so it was, that was very kind of the National Institutes of Health to trust mm. us. Mm. And before they gave us that money, that $30 million, they did a whole bunch of independent testing. So that the product got sent to Emory University and they turned it inside out and upside down. And 
um, and they wrote a nice little note which said this is the best product that we have tested to date. So that funding of the manufacturing facility in Australia yeah. was totally dedicated to the US market, supplying yeah. the US market that was effectively. A deal. That was a deal. So if you yeah. get money from the US government, then yeah. they want all the product to go to America. Mm. They didn't set the price. They didn't set, it was actually, you know, a thoughtful contract. They just said, we, we just don't want you to make it in Australia and then sell it in all over the world. We want the product to come to America, which is certainly fair mm. enough. And then you get this additional funding, Department of Defence, you're looking at $300 million plus. Yeah. Just give us the scale of this, because what, you, what you're doing, you're producing about, a, what, eight and a half million yeah. tests for the US. Just take us through the scale. Yeah, so the, um, the uh, I guess the, the way that, the way that that happened was that the on the back of the support from Radex, mm. we did what we need to do to take to the FDA, and on the back of that, and and Radex felt like they had some ownership of the success there. There was momentum that built within these agencies mm. in the US, and and rightly so because we wouldn't have been able to do it without them. Mm. And so, through that, an engagement opened up with the Department of Defense who themselves independently reviewed an enormous amount of this data. And there was a, quite a long discussion over a couple of months. And, and again, we had to work very hard to prove to them that we were worthy of those sorts of investments. Mm. They were obviously at that time really looking to scale up testing. And they wanted that not just for responding to this pandemic, which is obviously very important, and I think still remains very important, but more importantly for building capacity in America for future pandemics. Mm. So, you know, we always felt another one would come. Mm. And I didn't think it would be a coronavirus pandemic. I, I thought it would be flu. And so the US um, military funding is about building really a replicate, although bigger size, of the Australian facility in America mm. so that when the next pandemic comes, America will be better prepared to mm. respond swiftly. That's That's really what it was about. To do that, they want us to be able to make half a million tests a day. That's so quite a, that's a lot of tests, mm. that's a lot of tests. So now look, I know everyone here is gonna to wanna to know about the home COVID test. How does it work? What's its accuracy? And how does a US citizen obtain the test? Yeah, so um, it's in CVS and Amazon um, and other retailers, Target's coming, a um, bunch so of other distributors. So. Delta yeah. Airlines, so Delta Airlines as well. Delta Airlines are recommending yeah. the product um, for international travel, mm. really return travel coming back into America, so for Americans to buy it before they leave and then test themselves coming back. And I think we'll find that the other airlines do the same thing. Our test is very well suited for that. Um, and um, and so you would buy the test. Everything that you need is inside the carton. I should have brought one. That would have been a good idea. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, and you download a. We accept your phone. You have to bring your phone and a, and a free app. So you download the app. The app uh, walks you through how to use the test step by step. There's actually a video first, and then step by step instructions. And, and then a swab and so. Yeah, you take a swab. You take a swab of your nose, mm. um, and uh, then you you screw it into a little tube, and then you put that sample onto the test. So. There's a bit of this on the website about how it works. It's mm. as part of that process of those years of going through this with the FDA, we did a whole lot of, we did heaps and heaps of what we call human factors testing. And that means iterating the product and the instructions to get really confident that people will get it right first mm. time. Mm. And so um, that was also very important for the FDA because they kind of knew that we'd, we'd done that work. They'd already seen the data. And so they were, were completely aware of, of that. And so you take the sample, you apply it to the, the test, it actually Bluetooths into your mm -hmm. phone um, and the result is uh, communicated to your device and you obtain your result. You can then do with that what you wish. We make it possible for you to send that to your clinician. We're working through the integration for, to be able to connect you directly in with telemedicine. We give you a bunch of information about what that result means for you and your family. Mm -hmm. And um, where appropriate, we'll be looking to direct people to buy another test if they want to test their loved ones, if they think that's appropriate. So you're in discussions with the TGA, the Therapeutic Goods Administration at the moment, in Australia. I mean, what, why is it not yet in Australia? And what, what are the steps to get it, these home kits in Australia? Uh, yeah, so um, uh, the story around self-testing in Australia is a bit of a convoluted one, where we have some special legislation which says if, for notifiable diseases, you can't have self-tests. And COVID, like flu, and 
few others, is a notifiable disease. Mm. And that legislation was really written through the, through the perspective of um, not wanting testing to go underground. And, and that's fair enough. Yeah. And it's relatively, you know, it's, it's legislation that's a couple of decades old. There have been exceptions to that. Um, there was an exception made in 2014 for HIV mm. um, to let an HIV test be used here in Australia. There was um, a, a change to that legislation which was through a, a TJ consultation process in 2019 which opened that up for influenza testing and um, a whole bunch of other, a whole bunch of other illnesses. Mm. COVID wasn't on the list because COVID wasn't a thing mm. then. So um, we haven't formally opened conversations. We haven't opened conversations at all with the TGA about bringing the product to Australia. And that's in large part because we're focused on living up to our obligations to supply America and the US. We, we do, um, we would love nothing more than for the product to become mainstream here in Australia. And, um, and I think as we combine COVID with flu, which is the obvious pathway for us mm. for those serious um, respiratory infections, you know, going mainstream is the objective so that people in the US and Australia and other parts of the world can, can get easy access to that diagnosis and then can use that to make good decisions about their healthcare. Let's go to you. For, let's describe your CEO role and how you've had to exercise different attributes as you've moved along this commercial path. Take us through those different leadership precepts that you've had to adopt just to, to get you along this path effectively. Oh, Ray, it's really, it's really just been about um, creating the products that can succeed in the market and the company around those products to let that success happen. Mm. You know, the, the, we really wanted to create, um, to create the best tech for success for that purpose. Mm. And, and around that, build a company that could execute on that. And so I've always felt my... I'm a pretty product-focused CEO, um, so I'm pretty, pretty close to the product. Mm. And my role was always about um, growing a team to help navigate those technical challenges and regulatory and quality and now, and now manufacturing and commercialization. And so I've, I've, for me, it's always been about the products being successful. If we can make the product successful and navigate that pathway, Alum will will really be successful, kind of, um, kind of indirectly as a result of that, and and the future products and everything that comes. So, my um, I suppose my leadership has evolved with the company and grown with the company mm -hmm. as we've kind of run into different challenges and different problems, and um, and and of late, how we've had gone through a incredibly rapid growth phase which mm. has been um, exciting and thrilling and, and petrifying all at the same time to to deal with those challenges of really rapid growth it's been a it's been a ter terrific adventure when we were talking the other day you're a great believer in the power of teams you're great believer in the power of teams to deliver uh, you're a good you're what i've seen is uh, if i had to ask your team members tell me about sean and what do you think they'd say Um, I think that when the team, it's enough out of you, Pat Condren. <laughs> um, I think that when people's journey at Loom comes to an end and they look back at the end of their careers on the time at Loom, mm. I think that I hope that they will feel that, that we collectively did something incredible together mm. and that that probably wouldn't have happened without Sean. Mm. I, I th I think that will be, I hope that will be the case. From my perspective, I know that that wouldn't have happened without them. And so the, if they were to kind of ask about my leadership style, um, I'm close to the product and I'm close to the team and bring a level of focus and intensity around the big problems, which is I think what CEOs should do. Mm. And, um, and uh, we have a lot of fun and we cut to the chase and deal with our problems. Mm. So, um, so yeah, I, I think it's been, um, you know, it's not a walk in the park. And there's a lot of people that have worked very, very hard and at times have been very stressed. Mm. Um, but we don't play the man, we play mm. the ball. Exactly. And only ever the ball. When I was out there the other day and it was uh, the openness, the honesty, 
the culture is just, uh, you can't get away with playing politics in your culture, can you? you, just, you there's no blame mentality, you're just very open. Yeah, we kind of don't have time for that. Yeah. There's been there's been so much scale up and 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 pressure on doing things that we've really tried to stay focused on um, on on dealing with our problems mm. and um, and uh, I mean culture is such a hard thing as a company, especially when you mm. scale quickly. You can spend so much energy to create a positive, energetic, um, candid, which is mm. a deliberate thing. That's what it is. Candid culture. Um, so uh, and then. Mm. And then things happen that can wreck, can spoil that, and you have mm. to build it up. It's kind of a constant thing to nurture. And so, what do you do well that you never would have thought possible a decade ago? Uh, public speaking. <laughs> 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 um, so, I actually mean that. I'm yeah. not sure I would have a decade ago. I wouldn't have thought I would have had a chance at handling the mm. media. Mm. Um, um, some people in business might think I still don't. Uh, so, um, so learning learning about how to to handle those sorts of things mm. has has been a big learning curve for me. Um, um, but it has actually been part of has been good fun too along mm. the way. Yeah. So, what are the key attributes that all good entrepreneurs should have? The big attributes that you think? Um, I think those attributes uh, have have sort of remained the same for a really long, really long time, mm -hmm. you know, many, many generations. And, um, and they're mostly around persistence and, uh, and resilience, I think, mm -hmm. and a willingness to um, hang in there when things aren't quite working out and to confront, um, to confront your challenges and your problems in a positive but candid way. Mm. And um, and to build teams and to nurture those um, those important relationships and friendships. I think those things are constant across so many businesses. Whether that be <coughs> whether that be you know big entrepreneurs, um, you know the Rupert Murdochs of the world, or whether that be small scale entrepreneurs. I yeah. think I think those skills of persistence and yeah. and determination. I think are, are kind of at the core of that, um, as they are in much of the rest of our lives those people who choose mm. not to found mm. companies but have have their own adventure in a different way mm. um i think i think the persistence to to continue to chase those objectives is is the most important thing and i think if i asked your mum and dad who are in the front row here yeah. tell me about sean in, ter in terms of persistence resilience they would say that uh, you you capture all those characteristics well i don't know they might <laughs> Put, they definitely put your hands up. They, they might not have <laughs> when I was 14. <laughs> <laughs> Just let's go back to the, uh, the chairman and the board. You did yeah. put that in place at the right time. In a startup, what, what are your lessons coming out of getting the right chairman and the right board in place? Yeah, so the two most important people, um, I think, in the company are uh, my wife, who's our chief marketing officer and effectively co founder. Um, who is who is nothing less than brilliant, and Paul Darazet, who is the uh, chairman, and has been so since 2011. Mm. And Paul is a force of nature; he really is. So he's a he was he comes from the um, construction mining industry. They um, he and some some friends uh, founded and and successfully developed a metallurgical coal mine with ultra high purity coal. Which, um, which was used by steel mills to make steel. So it wasn't coal for power, it was coal for, for steel. And, um, and along that road, really learned a lot about people and mm. being an entrepreneur and mm. setbacks and challenges and, and all of those, you know, quite hard things. And um, he's a tremendous positive influence on the company. And, um, and yourself, clearly. Oh, yeah, terrific. Yeah, I mean, he's, um, he's, uh, he's been a terrific... Just, I couldn't, I couldn't overstate how important Paul has been, mm. and um, and when things are hard, like leadership's easy when things are easy, mm. right? It's leadership's hard when things are hard, mm. and when things have been hard, and there have been times along the way when you know the chips have been down, it's been Paul who's been there shoulder to shoulder mm. to yeah. to find a way and to sort it out. He's great. Now look, we've got some great questions coming through, isn't it? You're quite clearly passionate about helping people and the end result. How do you keep your hand in the day-to-day -day medical side of things? Oh, so I'm 100% in the company nowadays um, with, you know, 
600 employees of the company. Um, my clinical work is all now, my clinical focus is all now really around the product and the impact of the product on the people that use them. Mm. So um, I actually kind of think of everyone that uses our products and we've spoken about the home COVID and home flu tests especially, but we have other products as well. I really think of each one of those people as my patient. You know, I was involved there. I was mm. a part of that journey. Obviously only a small part for that person, um, but you know, making a million tests a month or more is, you know, there's a lot of a lot of little impacts on those people. Mm -hmm. So that that's really the focus of my clinical bit. Obviously, there's the bit of you know keeping my hand in from a you know, continuous education thing. But in terms of day to day medical practice, it's all about um, it's it's all focused on just on the business side of things. Mm -hmm. Understood. Question come through here too, I think we should. Uh, are we likely to see a quick self-test for insulin? It might help with the other current future epidemic of insulin resistance, um, metabolic syndrome. Um, I, th I um, the blood glucose measurement has been one of those incredible, um, has, has been one of those incredible industries. Mm -hmm. So, and the revolution that's gone through that measurement of glucose which you know, in the 70s was a very difficult thing. Even before that was not impossible. And death rates from, from diabetes, especially type 1 diabetes, were terrible. And you know, the ability now to measure blood glucose um, pretty easily is fantastic. Mm -hmm. And so with the, you know, as we move more and more into insulin pumps and things, I, I think we've made tremendous gains there. Um, specifically in terms of insulin resistance, I don't think that's going to be a self-test, and the and the reason that that I I don't think that is that that's that's something that a doctor can do, mm. and getting the result back the day after, two days, three days, is not really going to change care, and so the the places where rapid tests have the most value is where there's a time pressure to make a decision, and so for flu, for example, and COVID's going to be the same when the drugs come, the sooner you take the drugs the better they work. Mm. And so Tamiflu and Zofluza, um, which are both authorised uh, in the US and Australia for, for treatment, they're time sensitive things. A, a little bit like people um, will want to get Zavirax to put on their cold sores. Mm. The sooner they get that, the, the more effective it is. They're, all viruses are going to be the same like that. So these illnesses which have time sensitivity are going to be terrific for self-test. Mm -hmm. And illnesses which have an element of stigma around them are also going to be important for self-test. So sexually transmitted inf infections especially, where people are a little bit reticent to go and see a clinician. So moving that into their hands, they can do that privately and personally, whilst a slightly different value proposition to the infectious disease is also going to be part of the traje trajectory. Was there a point during the development or the, the scale-up that made you almost give up? And if so, what, what made you push through it? Oh gosh, there was there was one point when it was very bad in about 2014, right. and um, we'd been we'd been so our tech is made of a couple of different bits. One is the optics and electronics, mm. which um, engineering challenge went really well, and we got very expensive but very good. We got some outside help to to do that bit. The other bit was a fluorescent nanoparticle mm. bit that's based on a quantum dot, and um, wow, that was a lot harder than I thought it was going to be. So it was, you know, we'd been beavering away for a couple of years with an outside group based in the US. And I, it got to the point where I was spending like weeks and weeks on end in San Diego trying to figure this out. Mm. And, um, and we were taking an outsourced model. So we had an assay development group in the UK. You know, we had this nanoparticle group in the US and they were shipping stuff between the two. And it just, it just wasn't working. It wasn't working and um, we were running out of money. The mm. particle wasn't working. The optics was going really well. We're pretty confident in that bit, but the, you know, the system wasn't working. It wasn't there. Mm. And, um, and so like we were, we were, we were done. Mm. We were done. I felt like it was a solvable problem. We just didn't have the right solution yet. And so with our, um, our technical lead, uh, who's CEO, mm -hmm. um, Scott Fry, uh, we quite literally had options A to K on the whiteboard of how we could do that. And there's a whole, we'd learned a lot through the preceding time and we had a bunch of different options. 
And so that was the time I had to go and talk to Paul and say, Paul, <laughs> you know, we're in a, we've got a problem here. And um, I think that of these options, one of those is going to work. And so we should chase the highest likelihood couple. Mm. And, um, but we're going to need more money. And a sensible person at that point probably would have said, Sean, I think, I think we're done. A sensible person would have done that. And um, Paul said, we start, therefore we finish. And he invested some more money and our seed investor put in some more money and we found the solution to the nanoparticle and it worked. And we kept getting better and better over the years. We, we built our own lab to stop this stuff of having outsource groups that wasn't really working. We built our own lab. Didsbury Street, um, Paul even gave up his garage where he had his car collection to, you know, to, to do that. And, um, and so we, we ground it out. And that, that was really the tipping point. That's the point where we went, when that, then the particles started working and we had some brilliant people who helped us solve that and um, we went from there. It's a great statement for all entrepreneurs. We start, therefore we finish. Mm. Yeah, it's good, isn't Very it? Very good statement. Yeah, there comes a point, I suppose, you know, where you know there's it's there's a scale in that yeah, um, exactly. so well gladwell spoke about the uh, the gift of doubt yeah. entrepreneurs don't have the gift of doubt until it's too late to turn back yeah the, that whole that whole crossing the rubicon mm. um yep. concept which is uh very relevant mm. that was very relevant because i mean i had given up a lot mm. and sacrificed a lot and and um and so there was there was a it, it had really come to that. It was like, we, we must do this. We must find a way. And uh, it can be quite motivating and incredibly stressful. <laughs> As a game changer, uh, the game changer is one who approaches business in a way that uh, disrupts the status quo, challenges the norms, and creates a new way of doing things. Do, do you describe yourself as a game changer? Uh, I want to make products that can scale around the world to right. have maximum impact on people's lives. And that's, that's my main focus. Mm. And building the company around that to see that happen and see that succeed is, um, is what this is all about for me. Mm. If as, as a flattering byproduct, I get lumped into that, then that's great. Mm. But I, didn't, I definitely didn't set out for that. I, um, I set out to solve a problem and to just do the best that I possibly could to make that genuinely scalable and global. Let's come back to the people who work for you. What do you look for in the people who work for you? What, what, do you, what values and behaviours do they have to demonstrate for you to be interested in bringing them into a loom? Uh, well, recruitment's hard, as everyone knows. And the, the legendary Jack Welch, um, CEO of, of GE for many years, kind of rated at the end of his career that he got as good as 80% at recruitment mm -hmm. and um and finding people and uh and it's so it's difficult i think i like to work with people who are authentic and i like to work with people that have a, a positive attitude mm -hmm. and um and i think that's a really important foundation technical skill is great mm -hmm. and can be very useful previous experience can be great although sometimes people can kind of get guard railed by that um but you know, people who are who have a have a great attitude can normally grow with the role or bend into that role and and are prepared to um, are prepared to evolve into that position. So I, I think those kind of core values are very important. Obviously, it depends on the role. You know, a sales role is pretty different to a technical role, but that same that same those same values I think are pretty important to us in a loom. Mm. And indeed. You, you know, it, we try to avoid selecting people who are brilliant but incredibly difficult because it becomes quite disruptive for teams. It's almost better not having a brilliant person. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, yeah, so the attitude piece is very important. You'd know about this, but when Jack Welsh was appointed to the CEO role for the first time, he said the best advice he ever got, he was so nervous about appearing at the first board meeting that he had a tie on, he just tied his suit up and just try to get uh, just to relax, but he was, he was nervous. His first board meeting as CEO, mm. 100,000 employee company. Mm. He was pretty young too. Wasn't he, he was very young, he was in his late 30s, yeah. yeah. And uh, one of the board members walked up to him and said, Jack, I've just two, two words of advice to you. Be yourself. Yeah. We appointed you for who you are. Don't try and be anyone else, just be yourself. Mm. 
which is uh, yeah, authenticity is pretty important. Yeah, 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 everyone else right is taken. There. Don't try and be them. Is there a personal story you can share where you came to understand your strengths and your leadership capacity? Is there one story that comes to mind? Um, I certainly find that um, being authentic is is um, is really important, and and I think people see it. Mm -hmm. um, in, in we started doing um, all hands meetings once a week as a means of trying to give a consistent message to the whole team and to communicate things. And um, and it was really through that process that I just found that just being authentic and just mm. addressing issues and, mm. and getting them on the table and being being square with people was, um, was very useful and important. Mm. Um, and I'm not smart enough to tell lies, so it's better to just tell the truth mm. and to just work that through and to, to confront our problems. Mm. And so um, the other thing that I've really found is, is being positive. It has such an important impact. Mm -hmm. And um, we all like working with people who are positive and can, can share in that. Mm -hmm. um, and probably the third bit that I would say is, um, is a, a, from a leadership role, is being grateful. Mm -hmm. Because I am so grateful to the people of Alum. They choose, like they choose to work with us. They, they choose that. They could choose a whole bunch of other things, but they choose that. And they choose to, to do their best. And we kind of take that as a, as a given. We kind of take the attitude that everyone's working 100%. If they're not working 100%, that's a separate conversation. Mm -hmm. So if everyone's working 100%, it's then about saying, how do we as leaders get, get the best out of that 100%, which we owe to the company and the shareholders, but we also owe to the people working there. Like no one wants to work 100% and it not be worth anything. Oh so that's... That, we, I'm very grateful of that and being grateful shows that appreciation and um, and people want that which they should to be part of it which you know we wouldn't be here without the team. Another good question has come through citizen participation in science is growing is there a future opportunity for those tested to choose to anonymously share results for example as an early warning? Yeah so um, software gives us an opportunity to do magic things, collate data, send data, mm. choose what people do with that data. Um, yeah, I'm talking too much American data, um, <laughs> and uh, and so and so we can we can look to do that. And that the power of that is incredible, mm. especially when the next pandemic comes. The power of being able to do that in the community is um, is very uh, is very important. Indeed, that's part of the reason. Alum, Alum is one of the first diagnostics companies to be a digital native. Um, we weren't, you know, we weren't kind of a test company and go, hey, we should bolt an app on. That'd be great. Mm. But that wasn't us. It was, the app is a fundamental part. Indeed, it's, it's regulated. We, if we want to change the app, we've got to go to the FDA and explain why we're changing what we're doing and how we know that's not going to break it. So um, but through the app, we can do things that others can't do, which gives us a great advantage. Mm. And it lets us build guardrails and capture data and then generate additional value. Mm. And if we can help, if we can, if we can use that to help the overall commercialization pathway for the product, um, then all the better. Okay. Another good question too. Was there formal training you undertook around commercialization or you learned on the job? Yeah, all learned on the job. Right. And um, and lots of uh, listening and reading and mm. talking to people and um, still have lots to learn about all of those things. Mm. So, so yes, all learned from... I mean, a lot of those commercial skills... Whilst, whilst every industry kind of thinks it's unique, most of, most of those skills are actually pretty transferable. So Paul Darazet's experience in, um, in, the, in the mining construction industry, most of those lessons apply over, mm -hmm. you know, treating people properly, managing supply chains, understanding customers, you know, all those things are, are pretty transferable. Um, in terms of new product development, a lot of that thinking has come from Mia, who's my wife, and she um, is a consumer products, marketing person, mm. and her influence on the, the product design and the product placement and the, the communication approach um, has been pivotal. She's really, she's really led that bit. Indeed, all the way down to that user experience, she's, her, she and her team have led that. So the, um, you know, the combination of that, that commercial placement, that marketing, making the right product, mm. and knowing that it's the right product, um, Mia has been pivotal in and then the science I've really led with Scott and the team 
And then on the commercial side, there's been lots of influences from, from different places. Well, take us through the, we'll come back to a couple other questions in a sec, but take us through your roadmap for the future. Where, where do you want to go from here with a loom and what future developments uh, really excite you? We are at the beginning of a whole new category of consumer diagnostics for infectious diseases mm. and the loom has a head start because we thought this would happen 10 years ago and we've been able to um, invest in the technology to get that, to earn that head start. Mm. And so it's now about a matter of continuing on, um, both commercialising the current products and building the, the next wave of products to come behind. The obvious one is flu COVID combination. Um, the cool kids call it fluvid. Um, <laughs> and so, and and so that's that's underway and you know beyond that it's about it's about more products in that consumer space so um, group a strep which is the most common cause of tonsillitis is there's a lot of testing of that in the us and in other places and that would be a, a logical next one uh, sexually transmitted infections is certainly on the list mm. um, we are also working on how we can um, improve the sustainability of the product uh, we do use a lot of electronics in making this work it's a it's a super high performance instrument and, um, and we would like to think that we can get better at that. Mm. You know? um, we, th we think there's a lot of, if you can, by preventing these diseases, you actually save a lot of waste. Mm. You, know, you save a lot, of, a lot of waste, preventing hospital admissions and preventing infections and all of, there's a lot of improvements in terms of the overall sustainability picture. Mm. That said, where we can minimize our impact, we, we want to try to do that. And so there's, there's actually programs underway to, um, to look to build out that pipeline of products as we go forward, mm -hmm. where that can have a positive impact on reducing the cost per test to get to more people, especially disadvantaged communities, then all the better. Um, but it's really about building these, these products out. So if you're looking out, say, three years' time, you're looking back, how would you, want to see, how would you gauge your success? How would you see your success at that time, which would justify what you're doing? Our goals for a company are... Um, the number of people that we can have a positive impact on. Mm. And we actually have objectives around that. Um, mm. So we, we set targets on the, the number of people that we would like to, to have use our tests. Um, so that would definitely be one of them. Um, creating a loom as a, um, as a long-term, continuing to build a loom and the loom story and to build that team and um, for that team to be part of building an ecosystem here in Queensland of uh, medtech entrepreneurs um, would be terrific mm. and so um, and then showing that our technology can lead the world in these categories and those th three things really blend together mm. I guess um, but we're quite deliberate about that the number we want to we want to get as this out to as many people in, in different markets we haven't really spoken about it but we have a big partnership around tuberculosis testing which is a huge deal still in many parts of the world mm. And the core problem is is testing, and so we've partnered up with the most successful TB test called, which is actually a great Aussie story, now owned by an American business called um, Kyogen, mm. to use our technology to do that. And that product is getting launched very soon, which is very exciting. It's been a big long program, so we want to do we want to address big problems. You know, I'm not we're not really a niche product company. We're we're a big global problem focused business. So these common infectious diseases where we can use our tech to make unique products is is where we're headed and um and so yeah so if there was another catastrophic virus that appears yeah. you're well placed yeah you're agile you're adaptable you're well placed to really deal with it well and truly yeah. and that's what the dod's that's yeah. what the dod's mm. yeah, good. yeah throw them good. 300 million bucks and that's and and that's about creating um the systems to be as well prepared for that as we can be mm. and there's some things that you can do ahead of time the most likely future pandemics are influenza and coronavirus um, whilst i didn't really see the coronavirus pandemic coming with the value of hindsight you probably should have really like there was sars one and there was mers and these these were viruses that were kind of right on the edge of threatening to to break into a bigger environment and and um it was probably the obvious major threat after influenza to be aware of and so we'll be better prepared for both flu and coronavirus with with assays indeed multiple different assays to reduce the chance that the new one is one that we miss um, and then have versatile technology for um, you know for other illnesses that may arise whether that be a, an ebola or a zika or a, 
or another mm. organism. So yeah, the tech is very versatile, which is an advantage. Name of the game. Another good question. Are there any discussions uh, to make the self-test available to developing countries? Yeah, we want to see the product scale around the world, including to developing countries. Mm. Um, the challenges with that are kind of threefold. The first is the obligations we have to the US government, who themselves may look to, if they have enough of a stockpile, they may look to distribute that themselves with their, with their product. Mm. And they have hinted that they will, that they will consider that. Um, another challenge is um, you, you have to do the customer support piece as well. So if we were to, it would be like to commercialise a product effectively in any country, it's not just about kind of setting up shop and or putting it on the internet. There are these other things that have to go around that to do that properly. And those things, you know, translations need to be made, not just on the packaging but also in the app. Um, you need to adhere to the data privacy regulations in those countries and make sure that you're not breaching those things. Mm. You need to sort, sort out the customer support in each of those countries to make sure you've done that well. So mm. we are still a pretty small company. You know, we're several hundred people, about 600 mm. people. And so we, we kind of just can't do everything all at the same time. And, mm. and as a result, it's about prioritising. We're working through the... Uh, the um, uh, we're working through the regulatory system for several countries. So um, Canada, the UK and India are going to be the first ones. And we're making good progress there. Uh, India has an enormous challenge and also has a big enough English-speaking population that mm. we would be able to get there quickly mm. without, without major translation problems. We don't want to kind of rush a translation and then have lots of people misuse the tests and be let down because of that. And... There's just complexity that goes with all of those things. Of course. So, um, Can you offer any uh, parting advice for uh, emerging business people, entrepreneurs and innovators in the audience tonight? What, what are your big lessons coming out of this? Oh, goodness. I think every entrepreneur's journey is, is um, in many ways unique and in, and in many ways similar. Mm -hmm. And, um, and the, the, that's really for people to go on their own journey for that and to solve their own challenges mm -hmm. and to find ways. Uh, I definitely like working with, um, have found useful and, and I maybe didn't answer this before about the board, but I've certainly found other entrepreneurs very useful as sounding boards for, um, for being an entrepreneur because mm. they've been there mm. and they, they have a different, they have a useful perspective of knowing um, those challenges. Um, you've got to be in the water to catch the wave. So if you don't, if you don't try, you, you definitely won't get there. Um, unfortunately, there are sharks in the water. So, <laughs> Plenty um, sharks. so that's, that's right. That's how it is. One question that's come through too: How can Australian governments do better to ensure policy is keeping up with innovation in a fast-changing world? It's a pretty broad question, but uh, it's hard, isn't it? Um, mm. the, the so this, the state government, really through the two thousands and the Smart State Initiative, did mm. some really good things. Um, and my impression of that overall strategy was to invest in great science recognising that from that great science would come well-trained people that would have good ideas that would start small companies and that some of those small companies would grow up, mm. some of them wouldn't, but some of them would grow up with a view of creating um, you know, global companies based here in Queensland. And that, that would kind of be the payback. You know, all of those jobs, all of that, all of that, the head office stuff that goes around that and the value of, of that employment felt to me like that was the strategy. And, and I would like to think that Illum is the part of that embodiment. Mm. Um, certainly, you know, the, where I trained is, is really now the IMB, which is, um, which is obviously part of that initiative. And many of our team have trained at those institutes. So I think there have been some terrific things done by state governments. And mm. certainly the Queensland state government of late has, um, has been showing us support. To, to, an, to help us to scale. The R&D tax incentive at a federal level is a very important program. Indeed, has been pivotal for us. There, were, there was a couple of years there where it really saved our bacon when things were lean. Um, and so I think there is a willingness to do that. The difference is how they approach it compared to America, where uh, America is really willing to, to, to back companies to do these things and scale that, knowing that there will be spill on benefits. It's sort of a, it's a certain thing. Mm. There seems to be a different mindset in the Australian authorities about really supporting companies 
and um, and are more willing. And it's easier for them to support universities than it is to support companies, and I think that should continue to evolve. Mm. Universities are great, and I'm all for that. But you know, companies is also a big part of the value that will that comes in due course. If you look at university sector funding to to innovation funding in companies, it's they're very different things. So I, I think that's a place for you know ongoing discussion. One question has come through about uh, is it disappointing as an Australian that the Australian government has chosen not to support your product development up to this point. But you might explain in relation to that, this is a different market for your product, isn't it? Uh, we don't have the scale of COVID. Take us through that. Yes, yeah, so the, the Australian government has been supportive of us in years gone by. Mm -hmm. So it would be the first point. So we've had grants from um, Commercialisation Australia um, and then Accelerating Commercialisation. The, the programs were basically the same. There was a change from a, a, a Labor government to a Liberal government, so we changed it from CA to AC. Well done, ladies and gentlemen. And so, but it, 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 in essence, it's the same thing. And we've been the grateful recipient of those along the way. Um, I mean, that's relatively small money, really. It, it's, it's relatively small money. But as, a, as an early phase company, that was very important. Mm. In terms of, of late around the home COVID test, um, Australia to date at least, and I think this is going to change going forward, but Australia to date doesn't actually need our home test. Mm. Our home test is needed in places where, you know, the COVID is swilling around and it's mm. everywhere. In Australia, there are localised little outbursts here and there mm. and chasing those, chasing every single one, going for elimination is the right, is the right approach. I have no gripe with that. We've got to, we, we have had to, to this point, chase, you know, chase every single one. Because it's either, you either just let it go, go wild and you kind of go on with life and you deal with the consequences mm. or you're harder trying to keep it down to zero. And I think to date we've made the right decision there, painful as it has been, especially for Melbourne. Mm. Um, going forward, we can't, we can't do this forever. Mm. We need to map out a pathway that says, you know, we need to open the borders to an extent. We need to deal with these little outbreaks that are going to keep happening because... Like, what we, it just is not viable to do this for uh, forever in and Australia. Vaccine passports, of course. Yeah, vaccine passports. Yeah. Um, well, I think will be part of it. I think testing has a role in that to mm. to prove that people have been vaccinated, and we actually do a bit of that. So we have a product that can prove that, and we're, there's some discussions that are underway now about how that could be used to help open up borders. Um, but yeah, it's it, we need to we need to map that pathway out of lockdown because mm. it's it's you know it's. It can only be temporary. Mm. There's a plea here. Oh, yeah. There's pleas come through, and it's, I think there's a bit about the second plea for this. Can we access your COVID kits for point of care testing in our emergency departments, please? We have a, uh, so yes, but it won't be the home test. It'll be the, because we can't take that to the TGA mm. because mm. we're not allowed to. Mm. So that without a legislative change, mm. the TGA can't review our test. They just will, like, we, we haven't approached them because we know what they'll say, which is this, our hands are tied. Fair enough. So that would be a request to give to Greg Hunt um, and federal politicians to consider putting COVID on the list. Mm. Um, we have a point of care product platform called a Loom Lab, which is fantastic. It's the same core technology. It's designed for doctors and nurses. This is the product that I would have loved to have at the point of care in emergency. And um, it's coming. It's coming. It's you know, mm. uh, it's working its way through the FDA now, and on the back of that, we'll mm. be bringing that to Australia. And that's anti-gen testing. So, have you got COVID right now? As well as antibody testing. Have you had it in the past, or have you been vaccinated? Mm. Final question of the audience: too. Have you thought about going public for bigger funding? Yeah, I'm not sure if that question came from uh, someone from Morgan's. Or in the crowd. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure it's Tim Crowley. <laughs> exactly. Um, so. Look, there will come a time when, um, when the shareholders of a loom, mm. and some of them have been with us for more than a decade, seed funding in, mm. in May 2010. That's, that's a long time. Paul invested in 2011. Mm. Um, when they deserve to be able to realise some of the value of their investment. They've done the right thing by the company and they've done the right thing by me and we need to give them line of sight to be able to realise that as investors. That's, that's the game. Mm. And so... Um, you know, we are aware of this and, and the need to, to do this. 
We want to do that thoughtfully and at the right time mm. for the business. We want to we want to think about the trajectory of the business to see the products sing. You know, haven't making money is part of it. We have to make money because if we don't do that, we're a temporary entity, and that's not the point. Mm. Um, but the goal is to have the product sing, to take the products to the world, and on the back of that, there will be the money to be able to invest in more products and grow a successful company and, mm. and do all those things. I want to make sure that we make those big corporate decisions um, in in light of the company being successful. And so I think Loom is getting close to the time where being public would be a viable mm. option. Mm. I think I think listing too early um, can be um, unhelpful and we have considered listing in the past and in the company is in a pretty good shape to be able to list should we decide to do that. Mm. Um, but you you need to be in a place where we'd like to think we can get into um, in, into a, a, an established, trustworthy business relatively swiftly mm. so that people can have confidence to Predictability invest. and so on. Yeah, exactly. Can I ask you please to thank Dr. Sean Parsons? <laughs> Thanks, man. That's great. That's great. That's great. <laughs> thank you. Vote of thanks. Thanks, Amanda. Well, thanks, everyone. And can we just have another round of applause for Dr. Sean Parsons? Uh, and thanks also, Ray, for um, your facilitation of the conversation this evening. Wow, Sean, from a medical practitioner in a Caboolture hospital dealing with an apprentice who came in with the, with the swine flu to now manufacturing tests for COVID um, that are used around America and potentially now in other parts of the world. Congratulations. What a fascinating journey for us to be a part of. Um, and your insights about just personally how to manage through being from a medical practitioner through to um, you know an entrepreneur of of this innovative company, being authentic, being personable, just being really uh, honest with your staff. I think there's a lot for us to all learn from that as well, as obviously being quite resilient and continuing through the many hurdles and challenges that it sounded like you faced along the way. Congratulations, all the best for the future of Loom. I'm sure it, that is a very bright one, although I do hope we don't get too many more pandemics, <laughs> quite frankly. Uh, that's a bit of a worry. Um, look, thanks everyone for attending this evening here in person and online. Just a reminder that the webcast of this evening's conversation will be available on the uh, Queensland Business Leaders Hall of Fame website very shortly. Uh, also on the website you will find um, the next set of um, important conversations that we're going to have throughout the year, so please visit the website regularly. Uh, on behalf of the Governing Committee, I would like now to also thank uh, our sponsors, our principal sponsors, Picture Partners, uh, television sponsor, Channel 7, and our major sponsors, Morgans, NAB and RACQ. Thank you everyone for attending and for listening online and for all of the fabulous questions. Safe travels this evening and good evening.